So thank you very much for coming on to this um, webinar, which um, is really aimed at people who are thinking of applying for CESA. And I'm, I'm sure there are quite a few of you who have either completed the process or um, have, um, there, there are quite a few of you who have completed the process as well as those of you who have, um, are in the process of doing it. And this webinar might be, uh, for, for, for those of you who are in that position, this is more motivation to complete the process rather than uh, telling you how to do it. So we don't expect that um, people in that position will benefit as much from this web webinar in terms of actually how to do it. So what we're going to really talk about is how you could start preparing the evidence you need for your CESA application. Okay, and um, it's really about the essentials of that process. So what we're going to cover is uh, we're going to explain CESAR, understanding the new curriculum, getting to know your specialty specific guidance, the sort of key areas in it, and and ab about CESAR applications, what is the pass, what is the sort of success rate of that, and and do that from a lot of a bit of a review of the evidence, and uh, a lot more, and um, and so that's what we're going to cover, okay. But before we do that, I'd just like to introduce uh, myself and the other sort of speakers who are Tom Calver and Nicola Humroy. Humroy. So first of all, about me, myself, I am a consultant radiologist uh, for over 13 years. I've, I was initially trained in medicine from, from, and finished in 93. So I've had a broad experience from GP to medicine, internal medicine, where I did a full MRCP, and then five years training in radiology in the UK. And we kind of went through the process of CESA rather than, um, sorry, CCT rather than CESA. So um, that's, that's the process that I went through. But in many ways, what CESA is, is a sort of condensation of that process um, and in a, in a shorter time, and you have to sort of prove yourself. So I'm going to leave it to Tom to, to explain the whole thing. But that's about me. I also run a website called Revised Radiology dot com and southwest of rcr which has been probably one of the it's 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 about 12 years 13 years since i've been running that course and we are quite well known in radiology circles now i appreciate that many of you are not radiologists some of you at least won't be radiologists and i'm sure this webinar will will help you um, in a way and there are also other people and other websites that will be um that will be available to you now this is really just the beginning of the process. I'm hoping that we can do more to sort of motivate and help you uh, along the way. Okay, um, so this is being run through Coaching Circle, which is a website that we, and a program that we created for doctors to help them to understand what coaching is and to help them experience what made it so powerful for me personally as a, as a person, as a radiologist, as a as uh, you know an entrepreneur in every way coaching has a huge uh, benefit so, so i'm going to hand over to tom and then then nicola can say something great hi uh, well I, I hope that my camera and my microphone are working because i haven't uh, haven't quite had the same run up as uh, as dr jacob in this um, but my name is tom calver i'm one of the the founders and directors of bdr resourcing uh, obviously we're, we're running this uh, webinar uh, in conjunction with the, the coaching circle and, and dr jacob um, so my background is that I've been working in, uh, well, in conjunction with the NHS and, and with uh, medical recruitment services for just over a decade now. Uh, and where we fit into this really is that throughout that time, we've worked with a lot of IMGs who uh, obviously are, are pursuing careers and opportunities in the UK, um, but are not quite sure where to go in terms of getting their specialist registration and, and how to achieve that. So um, our background is in uh, helping doctors finish the, the kind of last bit, if you like. So um, obviously, Dr. Jacob is, is very, very well versed with the, the kind of coaching and the, the evidence guidance that he can provide to people. Uh, and we would help provide a kind of final stage solution to, to finish off the, the CESAR process, if you like, uh, when you finally do get to get to the UK. Um, and, I, and I'm here uh, with my colleague, uh, Nicola, who I think you might see in just a second. Yeah, thank 
you, Tom. Thank you very much. So um, I'm Nicola Humroy. I'm one of the company directors at BDI Resourcing, and I manage and head up our radiology uh, division. So I look after international doctors wishing to relocate to, to the UK. Um, and I think, it, you know, I'm really glad to be part of this uh, webinar with, with Tom and Dr. Jacob, because I think it's, um, it, it's, it's going to be extremely useful for anyone that's considering working in the NHS. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, uh, for that, and Tom. And um, so it's going to be a sort of joint act. It's going to be, a, it's, uh, we, we are going to do this very interactively. Can you put a yes in the chat box? So we know that people are willing to get started. It's something that we do. It just get, it, it helps us understand that you're fully engaged and in the process. And I'm going to ask you to do one more thing, guys. If you have any browsers open, um, if you can, if you can close them, if you can get a little notepad and a, and a, and a little pen, I'm sure you'll find some of this. Um, and if you can also uh, switch off or, or put your phones on silent so you can give us your full attention for an hour and a half or so, um, then I think you will find that this process helps you whether you are a Caesar train, a Caesar applicant, or you're on the process, or you've never thought of this before, you just want to come to the UK and work, and or even some people who have finished their Caesar or are looking to help other people, um, this will give you a sort of idea of the things that that are needed. Um, we will have time for questions at the end, so uh, till then it'll just be the three of us. Um, and yeah, Catherine is on online as well, so that's fantastic. And I'll leave Catherine to also have a video on, but I would be grateful if everyone else except the sort of main faculty have their video off, switch off their video, and make sure that you are um, your thing. And Catherine, we will make you a co-host, so Joe will do that for you. Okay, so put your questions in the chat box and um, uh, we'll go on. Now, I'm gonna start with a quote, okay? So every, um, Jeff Olson is a big fan of mine. He is uh, the, the author of The Slight Edge and the whole principle behind The Slight Edge is the, um, is the principle of, of co if the compound, in, it, it, the compound interest sort of effect of small actions, making a big effect. So every day, if you do something, that will lead you closer to a better tomorrow. And what we are trying to say through that is that if you take this process, it's, it's potentially a relatively long process, but if you do a little bit every day, I think you will find um, that it has a lot more, it, the process becomes much easier. And I'm sure Catherine will say the same thing later. Catherine, by the way, I just want to introduce Catherine. Catherine is, was the former chair of the equivalence committee or the people who actually assess the uh, CSER applications for the Royal College of Radiologists. So uh, she's very experienced in the process. So I welcome you along as we get along. So now I'm just going to hand over to Tom, who can then um, can go through the bulk of the slide. And I'm just going to stop my share now. OK, by the, the magic wonders of technology, you should be able to see the next uh, slide, hopefully. Um, so uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Jacob. I think that the, the, the obvious place to begin is, is what is Caesar and, and why is it applicable to you? Why should you be choosing this? Uh, and in its easiest form, uh, CESA stands for Certificate of uh, Eligibility for Specialist Registration. Um, and essentially, it's the way that a doctor who has not gone through the kind of traditional training route, the route that Dr. Jacob was just advising that, that he took through CCT, uh, would gain access to the Specialist Register. Now, the Specialist Register in itself uh, is, um, uh, is a register that allows you to act as a, a you know, you are a fully approved, independently uh, practicing uh, clinician within the UK. And it allows you to take on a, a permanent contract uh, here. So until you've uh, been added to that register, until you've been successful uh, in one of the pathways to that, uh, you can only work as a, a kind of locum or as a permanent uh, doctor within a, a more junior grade of contract. So that, that's the first thing to bear in mind. And um, traditionally, there are uh, three routes, um, the kind of general routes that, that you can be aware of. One is the CCT route that's already been outlined. Uh, the second is a, a CESA CP route, which is 
uh, almost an amalgamation. You would start uh, kind of midpoint through the UK training program and work towards a, a CCT that way. Uh, and then the final route that we're discussing today, Caesar, uh, is essentially a, a submission of a, a portfolio of evidence um, that the GMC and the Royal College would consider uh, to say that you have the equivalent qualifications, the equivalent experience as someone who has gone through that first route, the kind of the CCT route, if you like. So they want to make sure that you have the, uh, the same abilities and that you are just as safe as, as anyone who's done the UK uh, training uh, program. So um, really important uh, to, to bear in mind, depending on what your kind of prospects are, if you want to work in the UK long term, uh, where you are in terms of experience and uh, obviously a lot of people here suggesting that they've either completed FRCR or they're on that journey, um, you know, that will have an impact on, on which route you feel uh, would be kind of most beneficial to, to you and your career. Uh, so the, the new outcome-based curriculum uh, and what is this? Essentially, uh, this is the, the outline uh, of what kind of things you'll need to evidence as part of this uh, portfolio. And there is quite a lot of documentation required. So as uh, Dr. Jacob has said, if you can start to, to kind of put this together uh, as soon as possible, just bit by bit, it will be, become much easier for you in the long run as you move towards submission of an application. Now, the main criteria are called SIPs. Uh, they are um, capabilities in practice. And the first six are uh, generally uh, quite broad. So they're quite generic and they would apply to, to almost all specialties. So for those of you here who are not radiologists, uh, these will uh, apply broadly to your specialties as well. Uh, and then once I get to uh, SIP number seven, I'm going to pass back over to, to Dr. Jacob and we'll use radiology as a kind of example. You should still be able to, to kind of garner an idea of what might be expected. But all of these uh, SIPs, all of the criteria are outlined in something we'll discuss later called an SSG, uh, specialty specific guidance for, uh, for CSER. So uh, this is demonstrating uh, the professional values and behaviours expected of all doctors. Uh, and what that means is that the, um, the assessors are looking for uh, evidence to suggest that you are acting in, a, in an honest manner. The way that you interact with patients and with peers is uh, kind of respectful, uh, that you are uh, delivering the standard of care that would be um, you know, expected of uh, your organization, the GMC and the Royal College. Now, um, we'll, we'll suggest in each of these SIPs uh, maybe just a couple of um, kind of different pieces of evidence. There's a bit of repetition because you can use uh, similar um, uh, mechanisms to, to evidence each of the points. But to demonstrate this, this one, for example, you may look to uh, patient feedback or peer feedback, and that can be delivered in a number of ways through structured interviews, uh, questionnaires, uh, online surveys, uh, focus groups as well. Um, so, uh, you know, th there are a number of different ways that you can evidence uh, this kind of general practice. Another one I've written down here might be uh, appraisals. Now, if you're in the NHS already, uh, you should be working towards revalidation on a cycle. So appraisals should be a kind of normal part of your, your practice uh, at the moment anyway. Thanks for that, Tom. That's really useful. Um, and I think, interestingly, you know, you talk about patient feedback um, you know, depending where a doctor is trained or where they're working in their practice. I know that patient feedback tends to generally be one of the uh, difficult things to obtain. So again, this is why thinking about CESA from now is really useful because it will get individuals thinking about how they can gather that information. Yeah, absolutely. It might not, might not currently be part of your practice, but again, something that uh, Dr. Koshi can, uh, sorry, Dr. Jacob can help with. Um, in, in thinking about these things before you make the, the move to the UK. So set, set number two is engaging in reflection, clinical governance uh, and quality improvement processes to ensure good practice. And again, uh, quite simply, uh, the assessors are looking for the kind of positive impacts that you're having on the, the culture within your department, uh, the level of practice, uh, the, the types of practice that are being executed, uh, and that you are constantly reflecting and learning about the, uh, the activities that you're conducting and, and what kind of impacts they have on your future practice. So again, a couple of things that I've noted down, uh, quality improvement projects and audit, that seems a, a pretty, uh, pretty obvious one. We'll go into that a little bit later, but um, obviously identifying a, a, a topic that you want to carry out for audit, whether that's part of an improvement, uh, generally the, the patient experience, uh, conducting research and gathering information, 
uh, against the kind of criteria and the, the standards that are expected in the department now, and then looking at the comparison and deciding uh, and implementing a, a change to see what impact that would have for, for the better. So again, being part of those uh, projects, uh, being able to evidence full completion of an audit cycle, um, uh, and I think as part of the CESA submission as well, um, someone might correct me if I'm wrong, but there should be one uh, evidence of a, of a re-audit, so where you've conducted that kind of activity and then gone back at a later date to, to reassess that and see if the impact has, uh, has remained and is still necessary. And I would say actually that if you don't have a full completed cycle, it's not actually an audit. It, it really needs to have a complete cycle. So you need to think about that, um, really doing a, a few of those if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, another thing I would also add to that, Tom, um, is uh, clinical governance. Um, it, it's not actually covered in the FRCR examination uh, examinations. And I know, for example, we've had some doctors that have been interviewed by the NHS and have been asked questions about clinical governance. Um, and of course, they've not known much about it. So uh, again, this is why CESA is really uh, useful because it gets them thinking about um, those areas. Yeah. I think the important thing to note here is that exams are testing your competencies and they don't really test all the uh, some of the other bits of working within the NHS and I think Catherine will probably agree with me these exams are meant to check your technical skills and there's very little way of them testing the whole broad of what um, and that's across the board whether you're in medicine or uh, surgery or radiology exams don't test that so this is this is adding to that and this is about actually functioning within the nhs system uh yeah so uh the next one is uh set number three so showing that you can successfully function within the nhs and the healthcare systems and um, again this is something that you might not have considered if you're not working in the nhs uh, or working in the uk right now and that is uh, generally to do with uh, things like how resources are managed uh, how uh, projects and um, uh, services are commissioned, how they're funded, uh, how they're audited, uh, and generally, again, um, you know, your impact uh, on the, the team that you work within. So uh, kinds of evidence that you might be able to, to submit for this one would be uh, kind of reflections on your leadership style, uh, how they um, maybe impact on, on other members of, uh, of staff. Uh, it might be to do with, again, kind of cl clinical governance and audit comes up uh, quite frequently in these. Uh, and finally, your kind of involvement in things called MDTs or MDMs, people have different names for them, but a, a multidisciplinary uh, team approach to different cases. And again, if you're not working in the UK, that might not be something that you're, uh, you're doing as part of your regular practice uh, at the moment. That's right, Tom. Um, and I think, I'm, I hope I'm right to believe that they've got to evidence those MDTs for, is it the last six months? Yeah, I think the most, the most weight, according to the SSGs, is, is on the last six months. So uh, it's really important that, similar to audit, if you just list that you've done them, it's not enough. You will have to provide you know, minutes of meetings or case reports, um, uh, feedback from peers and your involvement in it. So it's not as simple as just kind of turning up and then listing that you've done it. All right, so sit, sit number four, act it as a clinical teacher and supervisor. So again, that one's pretty pretty straightforward. There's not much interpretation there. So what's your impact as a, as a leader uh, academically and clinically within the department? And you would simply evidence that through uh, kind of assessments and again, feedback from, from peers that you've been teaching, support staff as well. Obviously, this doesn't have to just relate to uh, doctors. It'll be other medical staff. So, uh, you know, nurses, other auxiliary support staff uh, within whichever department you're working within. Okay, uh, number five, engage in evidence-based uh, practice and safeguarding data, including imaging data. There is obviously a little bit of that one that is uh, alluding to the radiology slant, uh, but generally it will be the first, the first part of that will be pretty broad for other specialties as well. Uh, so again, understanding uh, and appraising new technological advancements within the, the kind of field, uh, how to kind of critically appraise uh, literature. So showing that you're keeping up to date with uh, Journal articles might be a way to evidence that. So, uh, and again, it's not just about, uh, similar to the, the kind of appraisals and uh, that you would do for your revalidation. It's not just about evidencing that you are uh, reading these journals and that you're attending maybe journal clubs, but actually making physical notes and being able to submit those as evidence to show uh, what you've learned and then uh, take a piece of uh, reflection. So, you know, stealing 10 minutes at the end of a, a journal club to write down just exactly 
what you've learned and how you're going to carry that learning forward in your clinical practice uh, and apply it to, to, to how you move forwards with your, with your role in radiology or, uh, again, whichever specialty you're working within. Uh, and then the final uh, general uh, SIP is uh, working well within a variety of different teams, communicating effectively with colleagues and demonstrating the skills required to lead a team. Again, that's going to come down to reflection on your own leadership style. It's pretty self-explanatory what's being looked for there. And again, the, the kind of types of evidence that you would use would relate to those MDT meetings uh, most predominantly because you're working with other, uh, other colleagues that will be well uh, well noted, you'll be able to evidence that quite clearly. Uh, clinical correspondence that's relevant to your specialty between other staff members, uh, again, diagnostic support services, uh, be that pathology, radiology, or anything else. Um, and then evidence of kind of uh, assessing others. And again, that can be uh, colleagues who are doctors or, uh, or otherwise. Uh, and I'm gonna pass, I think I could be right in saying, I'm gonna pass back over to uh, Dr. Jacob for the next bit. So um, again, we get back to the sort of slight edge principle here. So when you look at all this, it can seem like a, you know, a lot of work to do, a lot of evidence that you have to put together, and it can it can it can seem quite overwhelming. And um, but but again, as we said, as I said right at the beginning, it's small daily efforts are the key to staggering long term results. That is really the key of the process. And um, I don't know uh, if um, Catherine wants to come in here in terms of your experience with this. Can you unmute yourself, Catherine? I think I am unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes, there is a lot of work involved. And um, from my experience of several years sitting on this committee and about two years of being one of the co-chairs for the equivalence committee looking at many CESA applications every year I can say there is a significant amount of work which is involved in preparation. On average one application is between 1200 and 1600 pages which um, the committee members have to read through and assess and they were usually given about 10 days between seven and 10 days to prepare in advance of the uh, meeting which happens once a month at the Royal College, which is attended by various radiologists and lay members as well. So if you just look at the number of you know, pages involved, as I said, between 1200 and 1600, this is significant. There are a few applications which have a little bit less um, paperwork in there, maybe eight, 900 pages. However, the less information is submitted, the more difficult it can be for um, a committee member to come to favorite outcomes. So I would really urge you to collect as much evidence as you can. And the whole process I would say is probably in the region of between, I would say probably about a year. If you want to be on the safe side to gather all the evidence, to collate everything from the time the process is being started, so this is not a quick, um, quick process. It's not something you will be able usually to pull together within a couple of months. So allow the, the time, but also this time gives you the opportunity to fill any gaps and you know collect whatever is um, maybe not at the best standard. Maybe go over uh, everything again. So there's a lot of as I said, there's a lot of work involved. However, if everything's well presented and the um, application successful on the first round, obviously this will give you the quick access route to what's becoming substantive consultant, which obviously also goes with a much higher salary as well. If Koshi maybe wants to give me an uh, opportunity to screenshot, I can maybe just share a couple of numbers, um, if that would be okay. Yeah, I can do, but we're going to, we're going to come to a bit about, okay, let me just, uh, I think you've got screen sharing. Um, okay. Okay, super. Then I'll maybe just share really just so that people know. Hope you can see this. This is a little bit of statistics from 2015-16. Uh, so you can see there were 35 applications that we were evaluating through the whole year. Out of these were 23 new applications and it's almost half and half. So there were 10 unsuccessful applications. So that's a significant amount of people who failed on the first round. Review applications when we submitted within the first year of failing, most of them passed. But as you can see, this is not always a given. And there was even two out of three reapplications, which were then 
um, later on, which did not pass. So this is quite significant. Um, let's see if I can. That's maybe, yeah. Can maybe go to the next page. Yeah, for sixteen seventeen, um, again you can see twenty five new applications, out of which four were unsuccessful. So it fluctuates, but it, it really is to show that there is still quite a significant amount of you know, applicants, maybe up to about a third, who might not get through on the first attempt. And that's basically what I wanted to share. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to we're going to mention that again um, later on in the presentation. Um, uh, and I just wanted to say um, that I wanted to ask a question, Catherine, about how do you recommend people uh, collect this evidence electronically, I presume? And do you did you did you have a system that you used to encourage people to do? I think electronic is good. You have to make sure that you um, anonymize patient and identifiable data. For instance, if you submit reports, you need to make sure that you cannot identify the patient. Otherwise, this will be returned straight away from the GMC. Um, yeah, and just try to get as much of a variety in as possible because you will have to um, provide sufficient evidence for each different sub area. So in addition to the general specific uh, CIPs, there's also um, very specialty related um, related ones. So what, we're gonna, what I'm gonna do now is just look at some of taking radiology as an example, because obviously I'm a radiologist and so is Catherine. So it's easier for us to explain it from radiology's point of view. But for example, one of the SIPs would be um, appropriately selecting and tailor imaging to patient context and the clinical question. So um, making sure that you can evidence how you, um, you know, appropriately select and tailor imaging um, to the patient context. So if you have, for example, you have a patient who is um, um, a, ch a child, you know, proving that you understand the concepts of getting non-radiation, I, I suppose that's what it is, isn't it, Catherine? Uh, kind of showing th things like, you know, um, that you're not going to use C, uh, radiation or re reduce the impact of radiation, things like that, that you're choosing the right test. And if you can evidence how you helped in that process, would that be right, Catherine? Would that be roughly what is expected under that kind of... Yes, I think that's that's a good summary. Um, but as I said, the, the sometimes the evidence is not quite so direct. Sometimes you can yeah, submit something that's maybe going a little bit around the blocks, basically. Um, you have to sometimes you have to be a little bit creative. For instance, um, for let's say breast radiology, which was one of my specialty areas, not everyone has had sufficient evidence in this area. So we would suggest that people maybe do an attachment, uh, collect some workplace-based assessments, for instance, um, get some light on it, almost like mini appraisals done as well. So there are lots of ways that you can collect sufficient evidence as well. And for example, if you take now another one, um, provide timely, accurate, and clinically useful reports and imaging studies. So one of the things that a lot of doctor radiologists do is they, they make a report that is in a very standard format, but does not answer the question being asked. And in the UK, a clinical radiologist is a clinical, is a clinician who's a radiologist. And the clinician is asking you a question for your opinion. And you have to give a report that answers that question. And so if you can find ways of evidencing that, and I'm sure we can go through that in future you know, webinars on exactly what, how you could use examples of each of this, but it's very difficult to do that in a short webinar. Appropriately manage imaging examination lists, procedures according to the clinical need and professional expertise. So if you can demonstrate that, how you do that, you know, that would be another CIP. Another CIP would be evaluating image quality and utilizing the knowledge of sciences to optimize image quality. And this is where there's a little bit of, uh, probably a little bit of overlap with what radiographers do in your country, uh, or maybe in your own countries, um, but where, you know, as the radiologist, you're the one who needs to, to, to be able to, um, 
you know, look after the whole thing. You almost need to know every, everything that's needed to make sure that the image quality is good. So I suppose you can also play a little game maybe where you, you do an audit and the audit, you can use it to demonstrate the CIP as well. Um, so there are ways of doing one bit of work and um, sort of using it for other aspects of the, of the process. Would you say that's um, an okay strategy, Catherine? It's a little bit... Absolutely, absolutely, yes. <laughs> you know, you as I said, you have to be a little bit creative and you should be creative and, you know, any assessor would absolutely um, be okay with that. And so, you know, I know, for example, when I was a registrar, we would, we would do a, a, a research uh, project. And often out of that research project, you might create three or four publications. And that's the same kind of system where you're thinking about how can I make this, how can I make more of a, out of it? So in the process of collecting data, you might collect extra data that you can make into another sort of audit or quality improvement or uh, evidence of this. There's lots of ways to make the, the work go quickly. Um, safely manage the imaging and image guidance, uh, guided intervention needed to support emergency care. So wherever you can evidence this, this may be, for example, I don't know, MDMs might be a way of doing this, but the detail of it, I think we'll have to come to on another webinar. It's a bit too much to cover. Um, effectively contributing to a clinical imaging opinion, opinion to, to a multidisciplinary meeting. This may include things like preparation notes that you, you made towards the webinar, towards, sorry, the uh, MDM. Uh, when we do MDMs, we, we, at least when I did it, I used to make little notes about each case. And that notes that you make, if it's an electronic format of some sort, you could um, present it as evidence that you prepare um, and that you contribute. And you might also get um, multi-source feedback from the other people in the, in the room to see that, you know, um, what your contribution is was really useful. So what the assessors want to know is that you know how to manage a multidisciplinary meeting because when you become a consultant, um, no one is really going to show you that. You're going to just be put in the hot seat and expected to get going. I mean, I mean, I say it like that. There's always a little bit of mentoring involved, but that is what we're talking about. Okay, so uh, picking up from there, do you need NHS experience to get Caesar? Um, the really, really short answer to this is no, but as per the um, statistics that you've just been shown, uh, by uh, Katrin, I, I think that it is very, very useful. Uh, I think that in my time working uh, with medical recruitment internationally, um, I see very, very few applications come through that have been done solely overseas. So the best thing that you can do is put yourself in a position where you have gathered as much information as you can uh, before you arrive in the UK and then supplement or top up the, the kind of gaps um, with the experience that you gain in the department that you end up uh, working in. Um, I think that uh, I think that it's important to make sure that any trust you go to can can give you the support to and the exposure to the different aspects that you might need. Um, but it's not impossible. Um, but it, it is sometimes more difficult if you haven't worked in NHS. Is the, the answer to that question? Um, the reason for this is is just similar to what we can outlined in the SIPs is that what you're doing overseas uh, or have done previously overseas might not correlate directly to the curriculum of the, the CCT within your specialty. So in this case, radiology. Um, now, differences in practice uh, and the main ones that we touched on, um, you know, Dr. Jacob was just talking about multidisciplinary team meetings. Again, it may be that that's not something that you are uh, practically involved in, but even if you are, are you making those notes? Are you storing them electronically? Can you then utilize them as, as evidence to upload uh, at, a, at a later time? Um, moving on from that, so appraisal, multi-source feedback. Uh, Nicola touched on that at, at the very beginning. So it might not be that this is routinely part of your, uh, your role, but if you are working in the UK, whether you're working through CESA or not, you are required to revalidate. And so as part of that process, you are required to provide some multi-source feedback, so 360 feedback from both 
uh, patients and also from your colleagues. Uh, and again, that's not just doctors, uh, that'll be your seniors, your juniors, uh, it will be nursing staff, uh, other support staff. Um, and again, you know, you, you can collect that through a number of different mechanisms, whether you're using, um, you know, hand, handouts that you would give to a patient as a questionnaire, uh, or uh, more recently, you know, I've seen people using apps or things like SurveyMonkey as links to, to send around to, to people to, to feedback on their experience. Uh, so safety and quality activity. Again, we've touched on it a couple of times, but audit work, quality improvement work. So what are you doing and, and what are you involved in uh, to, to kind of increase or improve, I should say, the, the patient experience? Again, it may be that you've been involved with some work, but I'm sure Dr. Jacob would tell you that before you leave your country, uh, it would be important to, uh, to, cook, to kind of collate that, that information so that you can use it as evidence. And again, the, the guidance that's given by the Royal College might not marry up with the audit work that you're doing uh, currently. So there's a, you know, a particular paradigm that, that should be followed. Um, Catherine can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Royal College has templates for for audit work that you can follow to a particular structure? There are um, audit templates published on the website as well. So yeah, definitely there's lots of material available. Good, excellent. So again, kind of something you can think about uh, doing kind of before you uh, before you arrive. Um, clinical governance activity, I mean, I, I don't think there's too much to say about that. It ties in with the, the kind of previous uh, slides. Um, and I guess that the kind of takeaway from that is uh, the NHS experience that you have will help you consolidate your previous activity. And for me, uh, in my experience, the main take home and what I would always try and share with doctors who contact me who are looking to explore the, the CSER route or who have asked for, for what that entails is start gathering your evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, start gathering your evidence uh, as soon as you can uh, and, and take as much as you can from the practice that you've done to apply to your application. Um, uh, Catherine, I, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to, to add to that before we move on. No, absolutely. I think this is really, this is the most important because the more evidence there is, the easier it is for the assessors to come to a favorable um, opinion. And the difficulties are always when the application is very lightweight when, you know, as I said, less than maybe the 1200 pages. And when we, or, you know, the assessors have difficulty really trying to filter out, has that person actually done everything to be equivalent to someone who's trained in the UK? So, you know, the more the better in, in this respect. Yeah, I, I was going to say a bit later on, there's a, there's a slide about kind of the, the frequent reasons you would have a much better knowledge than, than I would, but for the ones that I've seen for why applications are unsuccessful and you'll never as far as I know you'll never be uh, penalized for providing too much evidence but you will always be penalized yes. for enough. yeah absolutely yeah. definitely I mean uh, Tom can I just um I'd like to add something to that actually um recently I I had a conversation with a doctor um about a week ago and uh, this was a, a doctor that we placed into the NHS and I think um, they hadn't thought about Caesar prior to coming to the UK. And so they hadn't thought about what evidence that they would need to accumulate, et cetera. And now that they were here, they were finding great difficulties obtaining that information from overseas, partly because one, they might not have covered it. And two, because of, you know, of the distance, et cetera, it was just meaning that it was, it was taking them longer to get hold of the information. And consequently, that's now delaying their CESAR process. So I think my advice listening to every, you know, listening to the webinar so far is that certainly for anyone that's going to be thinking about CESAR in the future, that they need to start planning from now. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, that's, that's the message of the next slide. You know, really, it's about... Um, starting somewhere okay and the 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 best you can do for tomorrow which is which whichever day that is that you apply for your caesar is to do your best today and um i i would say if you can get if we could at the end of this webinar if, if the only thing we've achieved is to get you motivated to to get started on the process where, wherever you are whether you're in india or whether you're in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or the Middle East or in England, or you're already a consultant, you know, already working as a trust grade somewhere, 
the best advice we can give is get started now, start thinking. And, and if you start today, you get a little bit of thing today and every day you're gonna get, you're gonna get there quite quickly because it becomes a motor and it, it has an exponential effect, okay? So, um, so the thing is, okay, if you wanna be successful, whether it's in Caesar process or whether it's in any part of your life really, it's the simple things that are easy to do. And, it, it, and, and often it's just doing that little, like Tom mentioned there, that five minute writing down your reflection after your webinar, it's only five minutes a day. It's easy to do, but the problem is every action like that, that is easy to, to do is also easy not to do. And the problem with, um, not doing it then and there is as i experience often with my appraisal process is at the end of the year panic you've got to now write up a whole lot of learning experiences you have to cook up reflections from stuff that you did maybe you know one year ago and it's not nice because you know you're being a little bit of a fraud really you're reflecting on something that is not live and I really would encourage, and I've started now to get a little bit more into the process of for my appraisal, when I attend a webinar, I write down my thoughts straight away. So you don't even need CPD points, but you, you write down your, your reflections on the webinar, post it onto your online uh, repository, whatever, whatever you use, or on a Word file, and that's there. It's live. It's real. It took you maybe two minutes to do, not five minutes. But you're then not spending hours and hours at the end. And it becomes, it's not good quality. It's not well thought through. And it's, it causes panic. So that's what we are trying. That's what I'm trying to achieve from this process. Uh, so uh, I think I've gone, I was expected to come in just one after you. So let me just go back. There's not much to, to say on that previous slide. Uh, only in that uh, it's really, really important uh, that if you want to understand fully, uh, you know, the, the different SIPs, uh, the, the different component parts that you're going to need to, to present as part of this portfolio, to read the, the guide documents. Uh, really, really important. The, the SSGs, the specialty specific guidance to your specialty. Uh, I've got a, an example here. So for, for one of the SIPs, it will give you a descriptor of what they're looking for, and then it will give suggestions of the types of evidence. So you don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to think long and hard. You will already get a kind of uh, a signpost in the right direction, if you like. But like Dr. Jacob said, anything that you do, it's all these little bits, these five minutes, 10 minutes of, of notes, of uploads. Uh, make sure that you are aware of what you can use and use that to your advantage, because the more you know that you can uh, uh, you can gather to contribute to your uh, your portfolio the better so what's the key to, to getting your uh, your your caesar uh, approved and again i'm sure Katrin can can um, tell a little bit more about that in a second but um for us from what we've experienced uh no application is the same because of the way that caesar is designed it's supposed to be about you as an individual and so because everyone using this route is coming from a different uh, country or using a different healthcare service, their training may be different, uh, the evidence that they've already accumulated may be different. Every uh, portfolio, every application that's submitted will be different. It's not a, a kind of tick box exercise that, you know, your application is going to look like someone else's. So it, it, the, the onus, uh, unless you have the support of somebody like Dr. Jacob and, and the, the coaching circle, for example, uh, the onus is on you to, to appreciate and understand what the SSGs are outlining uh, and then put together what you need for your personal uh, circumstance. Moving on to the next one, uh, read the training curriculum. That's really, it seems really obvious, uh, but really, really important. You, you're going to want to look at the CCT pathway and the curriculum that, that a UK doctor would be following because that's what you're looking to submit evidence for as being equivalent to, if that makes sense. I've used a lot of words there, but you, you need to understand what the, the UK training route is and what's included in that. So you can make sure that you are mirroring that alongside uh, the, the SIPs that we've covered a little bit earlier on. Uh, it kind of ties into this slide as well. Again, specialty specific guidance uh, and looking at the uh, the trainee uh, pathway. Um, a bit like driving a car. Uh, when you certainly in the UK, when I learned to drive, I um, studied and practiced to pass a driving test. 
Um, it doesn't necessarily reflect how I drive now, for better or for worse. Uh, but uh, in terms of the way that you revise for this, stick to the guidance and stick to the curriculum, even if you don't, um, I mean, you should be intending to, to practice in the same way moving forwards, but even if you're not practicing them now, and I think that's quite pertinent to doctors who, uh, again, are not yet in the NHS, is the quicker you can pivot your practice towards this, the, the better and more beneficial it will be in terms of gathering evidence uh, and transitioning into the NHS because that, that is the route that uh, and the way that people will function uh, when you arrive. Uh, sorry, I didn't realise I was unmuted. But <laughs> so if we just look at some key areas in radiology, um, then um, what we are looking at just as a list, for example, is um, appraisal. So definitely show evidence of appraisal that is really really uh, useful and and the appraisal process you can I, i'm sure that we in the coaching circle will be able to provide uh, in future together with Catherine. Catherine is actually one of our uh, coaches on the coaching circle and has been contributing with us for about a year now. And um, I'm sure that we will be able to provide a sort of appraisal service um, at some stage. I, I, we, we are right at the beginning of this whole process. I have been appointed as an appraiser as well for Everlight Radiology. So, um, so we should be able to help with regard to giving you pointers as to where to get appraisals from. Um, and then radiology reports, obviously, you want to get uh, anonymized, as Catherine said, they're anonymized um, radiology reports to show to the assessor the kind of reports that you, you have created. And there was a question here about being reported under supervision. I don't think that is a problem at all because most um, most registrars, all their reports are reported under supervision. So whether it's nuclear medicine or whether it's radiology reports, there's no problem uh, if they're reported under supervision. That's no problem. Uh, there's a question about how many reports. Um, I think that's something... I think I'll have to leave to, <laughs> to Catherine to answer. I don't know how many report, what the kind of number is. Uh, Catherine, maybe you can just rep answer that quickly. Again, very simple. The more, the better. You want to make sure that you have reports in every single area, be it pediatric radiology, nuclear medicine, um, breast radiology, and so on. So the more you have, the better. So it's not sufficient to, an appraiser or you know someone from the committee will not look favorable at your application if you, for instance, only submit one or two reports for one particular category. So go through the curriculum, list every single subspecialty area and start collecting your evidence and your reports for every single one. And you certainly don't need to include images in your reports. I, I, you certainly don't want to get into that kind of complex area. You don't need to do it. But one thing that Catherine mentioned there about um, multi-specialty. So, when we get a CCT, we're getting a CCT in general radiology, um, except for interventional radiology. Um, general radiology is the CCT, so you need to demonstrate all the areas. And I know many of you might be practicing in very subspecialist areas, potentially. That will become an issue. So it's, it's a good idea then to start doing some general work and getting general reports. And, at, you know, you don't want to get data from 12 years ago. You want to submit evidence that is fairly recent. And it doesn't uh, matter where it is from, you know, whether it's from India or wherever, you know, it, it's fine as long as you... You demonstrate it and you want to demonstrate audit and QI, very important quality improvement, workload statistics. Now that is something that's actually very easy to do for radiologists particularly because all you need to do is just uh, get your um, kind of um, the, the guy who does all the reports, he'll just give out a report of how many reports you did in a year. And what we are trying to demonstrate is that you're doing a certain number of um, X-rays, certain number of MRs, CTs, you know, in a year, and and to to demonstrate that you actually can uh, be a productive radiologist. Um, and X-rays is a really important one because a lot of people in many countries, especially in India, I know that they don't routinely report X-rays. So that's something that you, you might need to, if you can't get access to them, then that is an is opportunity to actually try and get an NHS position after you've done your FRCR to get some X-rays under your belt, you know, plain imaging. Um, MDTs, I've already mentioned, and then the um, FRCR, the SIP2, uh, 
I can't remember which exactly which one it is, but the FRCR I think is 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 key. Um, it's very unlikely if you're outside the EU. It's almost it's very it's really unlikely that you're going to get a a, a, a Caesar without an FRCR. Um, I think Catherine, that is that's pretty clear, isn't it? It's yes, it is more or less expected. There are maybe some except acceptations, but you know, I would say just exceptions. it's yeah, exceptions. It's it, you have to have it, and also um, in terms of the time frame, remember it's five years. So you've got um, you know the wait is on the last five years. So it doesn't even have to be something you've done in the last year or so if you haven't done any particular part of radiology but you have done it within those five years, that's okay. Yeah. In terms of, for instance, you mentioned interventional radiology, you are expected to show some evidence of interventional radiology experience. But again, it doesn't mean that you cannot be, again, very creative. If you have done image-guided biopsies or drainages, for instance, this can you know, count towards interventional radiology experience. So it doesn't have to be high-tech and, and very complicated. Um, and that's why we're here. And and the other thing I wanted to say in terms of appraisal, I'm, I'm also um, an appraiser now for ID Medical, which is um, a very large organization that looks after looking doctors as well. So um, I'm also experienced in appraisal processes. Um, and we'll answer some of the other questions as we come along, okay? Um, now, the, yeah, it's already been answered by Catherine. The last, the most weight is given to the last five years of your clinical practice. Um, and this will give you a better chance of meeting the requirements because it covers a good breadth of your activity. Um, but, but evidence of training is useful, even if it was more than five years ago. So don't uh, kind of, you know, completely ignore that. You can, you can use that. Um, now, you don't have to have done all of this in the same post. So for example, appraisal and radiology reports from different jobs are all acceptable evidence. You know, no one's expecting you to do it all in the, in the same kind of position. Um, certainly think about double reporting, MDT activity, FRCR, CPD, and reflections on CPD. All that is going to, to help you. Um, double reporting is 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 very much the question about um, the question that was asked about supervision. That is a sort of double reporting. So it's actually very good to have supervised reports. Um, I, I I think um, in your CV include everything. You need to know how to to write a CV properly, and that's something, of course, we can help you with at some stage. And I'm sure Nicola and Tom have a lot of experience on, on um, helping doctors present their, present their information in the most attractive way for the NHS. Um, also interviews and how to attend interviews, that is something I'm sure they can help with. There are lots of courses available. Those are all really useful uh, skills. I know, um, I can say from my own experience, when I came to the UK, I tried for a lot of jobs, but I struggled getting it because I always undersold myself. I never sold myself properly. Whereas um, the whole mentality in the UK is to sell your, your, your skills, sell yourself, be confident, and I'm now a completely different person. And, and that is proof that you know it can be done. Does Tom want to say something there? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we, we do a lot of preparation for doctors. Uh, you know, part of our role is obviously finding interviews and arranging them, but a really big proportion of our time is sharing information like we're doing now. Uh, and that involves also preparing people for interviews, making sure that they've got the resources to write a, an, a, an attractive CV, if you like. So um, we see a lot of, lot of different CVs from a lot of different places. There's lots of different font sizes and colors and photographs. Uh, and there, there is um, for us a generally accepted template, um, which which is freely available. So um, you're absolutely right. That's really important, Dr. Uh, Jacob. It's, it's something and um, and I just want to get, get the sec for the little uh, just to sort of pause here for you to think generally, doc, uh, my fellow doctors, stop and think a moment about who you want to be and why and. Um, do you want to be a doctor with a secure job in, in the UK? And also these processes help in Ireland, I think. 
um, you know, it's, it's very similar. The, because the only thing stopping you from becoming that person is one action, okay? The action of starting the process of applying for Caesar, okay? So it's the difference between who you are and who you want to be is what you do. And that's, um, that's, that's the message. So yeah, uh, over to you, Tom. Tom, you want to continue? Yeah, we're, we're just going to talk very briefly. And again, th this is solely based on our experience of, of helping Dr. Sue's process on kind of the, the areas where uh, there are inadequate or that poor performance and uh, poor evidence, sorry, can, can lead to, to rejections of applications. And again, I'm, I'm very conscious that, um, that Catherine's probably very, uh, very much in a, a good place to comment on that as well. Um, but, but in terms of our own experience, and, and again, kind of speaking directly to you, uh, that that evidence, and I know we've probably laboured the point there, is is the biggest thing. Is uh, people who are um, submitting um, lacking evidence or or not enough. So I know obviously that there was a comment uh, that Catherine made about uh, you know submitting one or two um, case reports, but for the different areas, um, you know the more the merrier. We can't stress that enough. That's most of the the rejection that we've seen, um, and and also when it comes to those MDT meetings and particularly audits is showing the full completion. I know Dr. Jacob touched on that as well, but showing that you've completed that full cycle, that full assessment, the implementation of, of what the, uh, the outcome had uh, taught you about what, what needs to change or what should change and how that's affected uh, the, the, the practice going forwards or the experience of the patients or staff going forward. So for us, that, that's the, those are the three main points. So it would be lack of evidence submitted in each of the areas, be that for um, the, the clinical uh, aspects of your specialty or the general first six SIPs, uh, the, uh, the uh, audit criteria, so making sure that you're evidencing how you've been involved with that, if you've been leading in that, uh, and that you've completed full audit cycles, uh, and then also the, the MDT involvement, so working as part of multidisciplinary teams to, to assess and, uh, and manage patients. Um, I mean, really, that, that's the, those are the three main things that we've noticed. Uh, Catherine, maybe, maybe you want to add to that? Um, there are a couple of other things. One that comes to my mind is, for instance, it is expected that you provide a reflection on a complaint. So ideally, you have a complaint that you've experienced yourself that you can write a report about. Because really, we want to see how, how does someone deal with, with complaints, which will always happen. When you're working, you will get complaints. It's, it's, you know, if you don't get any complaints, you have done enough work, in my opinion. So it's, and you really have to ask yourself. And for those who maybe haven't had, they, we would recommend write a hypothetical um, hypothetical complaint and how would you react. But it's even better if you have had something that you've experienced that you were involved in yourself and you reflected on that. Yeah, that's that's actually something that comes up in interviews in the UK as well. If you're not here yet, um, sometimes you get asked about how you handle complaints. Um, I, I have sat in on interviews where doctors have said that they're perfect and they've never had a complaint and that never goes down well. I haven't seen anyone that says that uh, get a job. So you have to show a bit of humility uh, and, and again, um, you know, be honest about. I think in terms of uh, catching your work as an appraiser as well for a locum company, when you're presented with personal development plans and you're conducting appraisals, it's not it's not about tripping people up and asking them if they're bad doctors. It's about showing that you have reflected and that if there are areas of your practice that are weaker than others, there's a clear plan for how you're going to develop that moving forwards. Absolutely. It's, you really want to demonstrate what have you learned from maybe this incident or this problem and what are you doing differently? Because in this respect, you know, every error, any complaint, anything that hasn't gone according to plan is actually a fantastic opportunity for you to improve. And who doesn't want to improve? Uh, excellent. Well, I think, um, Dr. Jacob, we're, we're back to you now for, uh, for the rest. Yeah, so I thought I'll just uh, move to this about things about feedback and what you should include. Um, so certainly format your appraisal information. There's been a few questions around whether you should anonymize your the consultant's name and your name and i would say generally speaking just anonymize everything would you say catherine you or do would you include uh, the the supervisors uh, would you anonymize that as well or no, not no not necessarily because sometimes we kind of picked some something out before well this is not really consistent or there's something not quite right but you certainly want to anonymize patient uh, data 
you may yeah. want to anonymize a colleague's um, um, ID if that person is mentioned maybe in a particular complaint or something, but otherwise, no, you don't have to do that. Well, that's very helpful. And the other thing is, you know, where you've got patient feedback, you know, you, you should try and include that. And uh, Catherine already mentioned that, so I'm not going to go into that anymore. And we've already... Um, the, the, the thing of the reflective learning diaries and personal development plans to evidence how you're addressing your objectives. Now, uh, someone asked in the, in, in the chat about, is there a website or where we can start um, putting in this stuff? There is a lot of websites out there. I can't name one off the top of my head, but I'm sure we can, we will, when we create a program to help Caesar applicants we will try and find something that you know where we could advise where you can put your sort of learning diaries and personal development plans we certainly will be having that on the coaching circle so you know where you can write notes and and put your own development and then you just take a print out of that you know so that will be possible um, you need to evidence teaching and uh, teaching feedback um, that's really easy to do because because once you've done a lecture, you just send a feedback form. I would recommend, um, guys, that you don't just do one to five, what, what was the level of my teaching. Often the best um, evidence is you, where you, we leave text boxes where people actually fill up saying it was good or, you know, this could be done more. The more text you have, the more evidence that is, you know, one to five is okay, but it's not as good as text. Um, and uh, you certainly will be giving the the Caesar um, the the people who are the, the the Caesar evaluators quite a bit to to work through, but it, it gives a good impression to have a lot written down. Um, you want to evidence management activity. Certainly, that's some kind of feedback that you would you would want. For example, assessing others, appraising others, leading MDT. Some of you are senior consultants in your own countries. This should be easy to do. If you've been chairing meetings, if you've been um, a lead for the journal club, if you've been managing budgets, if you've been running courses, maybe or helping with a protocol or a development of a pathway, uh, whether you're a radiologist or otherwise, or examples where you've just helped to address a, a problem or a new or a new demand, you know, those are the kind of stuff that you would, would be evidence of management activity, okay? Maybe I'll just come in as well, even yeah. something as simple as organizing the, uh, the on-call router or day-to-day -day router can be submitted as management experience. So this is something, if you maybe haven't had any access to any other management um, yeah, evidence, that is something that can be easier to achieve. Or if you haven't had anything at all, I would suggest that you book yourself in on a management course and submit this as evidence. This will also, if we know someone has just virtually come out of a training, hasn't had much experience in their department to take on leading management roles. But if you have already collected maybe some online CPD in terms of management and a management course, that can be really, really helpful as well. That's really helpful. But I would say that actually getting management experience is not as difficult as you think. You can always go up to your consultant in your own hospital and say, I would like to organize the on-call rotor. They'll probably be very thankful to you or something that where you're solving your clinical leads um, problem, whether it's managing trainees. Maybe you want to set up a training program and organize regular teaching. What does that do? It shows you you have an opportunity to tick a box on teaching. Uh, you've got to tick a box on feedback from, from that. You also tick a box on management because you're organizing it. That's what I'm talking about, where you actually use one activity to tick many boxes. And if you, do, if you play the game right, you'll, you'll find that this process is not as tedious. Um, your referees. Now, regarding referees, okay, it's quite important that your referees are referees who will be positive but who can comment on your current employment and employment from the last five years. You want to cover enough. So it's important that you choose your referees carefully. Um, I don't know, Catherine, if you have anything to add on the choices of, of, um, of, of how, whether you take refer referees very seriously or not. 
um, but they certainly should provide detailed support of your competencies, would you say? Yes, or? referees are very important. Um, these are probably most, you know, there's, there's a huge weight on the opinions of the referees. So you, and you want to make sure that you have referees from your current post as well as previous and not just maybe a few from a few years back. So you really want to make sure that you, you get a good range of, uh, of referees together as well. Yeah. And uh, so there's been a few questions about teleradiology um, and we'll count that, we'll cover those. We are almost now at the end of the presentation. Um, so um, that's, so I, I, I really want to just uh, sort of, we're coming to the end now. The truth is what you do matters. What you do today matters. What you do every day matters. So again, start now and you will, um, you know, uh, you'll be able to, um, you know, get a successful result um, within hopefully the next 18 months if you've been already create, uh, picking up data. So my, I would say the main takeaways we want to give, okay, above, above everything, I think, is that you have to start now. If you start now, you get a result, do a little bit every day, or at least, you know, whenever you do an activity, think about it, embrace your specialty specific guidance rather than thinking of, of this as a problem. Get to know your curriculum, use this opportunity as an opportunity for development. Keep an eye on the websites because both the colleges and the GMC websites can change. Now, and, and at least in clinical radiology, um, um, it, it is quite high in a way. Um, I know that it looked a little low the first time, but it's still not um, hopeless. And hopefully, with the advent of what we are doing, for example, what Revised Radiology did for, for, radio, for FRCR, I think has made a huge impact on the pass rates and the exam. We've seen our candidates get, you know, some of our courses, we get almost 90% pass rates um, on the FRCR 2B exam. I believe that this process that we've started for CESA will also enable you to get that result. The details are yet to be worked out, but I'm sure we'll be able to, to work something out for those of you who are interested and we'll certainly send you a sort of feedback form to try and find out um, about that. Um, Joe is gonna, Joanna is gonna post our CESA support group, which we've started and hopefully you'll be able to get more data uh, information if you can join this group on telegram in order to uh, you you probably need a telegram account but that's not um, very difficult you just go to telegram.org and you can download telegram onto your computer onto your um, phone uh, tablet whatever and then if you join this group you will have um, you will have uh, uh, details of it so yeah so uh, I think Joe has put that link again and um, I've put it again there. So that's the Telegram link. We're gonna now get into questions. I just wanna say, if you wanna contact us, this is how these are our, our, um, our details. So BDI Resourcing is bdiresourcing.com. Um, you can contact Nicola for radiology and Tom, I'm sure one, any, they can always point you in the site, right direction. You can email at um, apply. I don't know if you've got your own email addresses, uh, Tom. And um, yeah, if, if anyone just wants to add um, uh, Nicola Humroy, so the, the screen name, just all one word, or lowercase at bdiresourcing.com. So the same post fix uh, or my screen name as well, Tom, Tom Calfer, all lowercase. Uh, and I, I think that, for us, uh, if you go to the website, there's lots of blogs, there's lots of blogs, we do a podcast and it's just all information about, I think particularly if you're not yet in the UK, there's information about Caesar, the different postgraduate examinations uh, and everything from the mundane things like opening a bank account or public transport in the UK and what it's like to live in different places. So there's a lot of general information there. And there are also some really good uh, YouTube videos on, on the BDR resourcing website, um, which I saw where, I don't know who it was, Callum or one of the others had produced a video on the various pathways. So there's more information there in terms of uh, how to, um, on, on, on the whole process, the sort of essential things. And what the coaching circle is coachingcircle.online. I would certainly, um, 
ask that all of you make an account there. It's completely free. Go to coachingcircle.online um, and you can just register for an account. I think uh, Joe can probably put the, the direct registration link and you then make an account and then we can we you can get at least a little bit um, oh the group does not exist uh, Joe is that right um, no I think that it, it does say the group exists so that's uh, the telegram group certainly exists um, but um, if you want to join the coaching circle we run three web three sort of coaching sessions together with Catherine and two other people one is a very experienced um, is a is a is a coach a leadership coach who's got a management experience from working with uh, the Manchester City Football Club so he's a Manchester City Football Club coach and we've also got two leaders who who um, who present a lot of information and the important thing is we help you we hold we help you keep accountable and that's how this whole this whole journey of caesar and our involvement with caesar came from that group and i hope um, all of you have found this detail so if you just take a screenshot of that page then that's uh, good so i want to just open up to questions and i'll give it to joe to ask and i'll i'll tr sort of try and answer what i can but mostly we've got about 15 minutes for questions if joe asks then i'll wait for you know catherine and tom to try and answer some of it sure so we've got a really long list here i'll just go through it yeah, yeah. quickly if we can um, uh, summarize it if it's the same question then we don't have to ask it again but yeah sure so do you have any um advice or group for uh Orbs and gynae so we don't have a group for Ops and Gynae. So what I would suggest is you could either join, you can certainly join the Caesar support group, which is general. And I'm sure that at some stage, um, you know, there will be support for, um, for people in Ops and Gynae. There's also another group run by Walid, which he's posted the link to earlier. That is, a, that is for anesthetics, but also covers other specialties. I would say that a lot of the processes are very similar. So, uh, you know, it, it's, um, that, that's the answer to that question. Yeah, so here's another one. Uh, I am a nuclear medicine specialist from India and I'm in the, in the NHS on MTI. Uh, are there any specific points for me to get my CISO? I wouldn't say there is. In fact, you have a huge advantage being in the UK and working in uh, MTI to, to, to be able to fill up all those competencies quickly. I think the simple thing is just get started with the process and you will find that um, you, 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 you will get the competencies you need. Um, any uh, tips for CESAR for IR as a subspecialty? I think I'll have to ask Catherine that question. I don't know the answer specifically for Kat, for for IR, and I don't. Yeah, it is possible to apply for accreditation in only a specialist area, be this interventional neuroradiology, um, breast radiology, and so on. But most of the time, um, it will be for everything. Okay, so I am a radiologist. I have finished my FRC and I've got a job in the NHS. I want to know what documents I need to collect from India. So I, I would say that the documents, you, you probably need to go through those. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, there's a lot of documents, obviously, but we've gone through a lot of that in the presentation. So that might be a question that's come up earlier. Um, that might have been a question that's been answered by the webinar, I hope. Okay. Um, is there any way to pursue a CCT after FRCR? A CCT, I don't think if you have not, if you, um, Catherine may be able to answer this, but I think the answer is no, because CCT is really the process for people who are training in the UK. That's my understanding. Yes, yeah, CCT is the UK training route. So if you do get it Caesar, which is the equivalent, um, you, you don't need the other one. You know, I'm not quite sure I understand the questions. If you're in the UK, you get your CCT. If you're coming from abroad and you want to practice here, you're and you're not coming from Europe, 
you have to go through the CISA route. To get I think it. the correct the question has come because people have this impression that CCT has a different weightage to CISA, um, and that might have been the case in the past where people thought, okay, CISA is a sort of a second second class no, citizen, no. but it's no longer that. You it's know, got it's, the same it's, weighting. You know, especially because as an um, you know in the equivalence committee, everything is absolutely scrutinized. So you're you know, the whole process, as I said, it can take up to a year to collect everything, all the evidence. You are assessed just as someone who has trained in this country to make sure that your training experience from another country is equivalent to the training experience here, that you are safe to work as a consultant radiologist here in the NHS or another consultant, obviously, if you're working in a different specialty. But my, my experience is from, from radiology. I think if I can add to that as well, because um, we get that question quite a lot from doctors is, is wh which is better, essentially, and, and obviously that's a very personal personal choice. But when you look up somebody on the GMC website, for example, using their, their reference number, it, it's binary. It's a, it's a one or a zero. You're either on the specialist register or you're not. It doesn't tell you which route was uh, was used to achieve that. And so, quite frankly, it, it doesn't matter too much. There is a middle ground that's Caesar CP, which is entering UK training at about halfway, but it's not common that people would take that up. Um, and you would still, we would recommend that you would you would want to have FRCR if you were going to do that. So that actually ties in nicely to the next question, which was a description of Caesar CP and uh, how to get a job using that. Uh, I mean, uh, for, for us, that, that's essentially applying for a training rotation, but entering, as I say, at a midpoint, so usually around an ST3, ST4 level. Um, so it, it's very hard to, to get into training applying directly from overseas. So if you are going to go down that route, you may want to look at applying for a service level role. But again, that will be very difficult, particularly if you don't have uh, FRCR. And then once you're in the UK, applying laterally for a, a training number with your deanery. Um, so... I would say it's a it's a diff, it's not impossible. There are people that do it, but it's a it's it's not as common a process that people would go through. So without any previous evidence, if we start a fresh collection of evidence after working in the UK, how much time should it take to gather everything that I need? Um, Catherine, isn't it five years then? If you get to start from scratch, it is. It is obviously you know the evidence is weighted across the last five years. But if you're starting from scratch, it basically takes as long as it takes. How long is a piece of string? It's yeah. as long as you have all the evidence, you know, you go and look through the application form. It will tell you exactly what you need to collect, what you need to submit. As soon as you have everything together, and obviously Koshi will also probably um, give you some information about how you can join groups here so that we can support you in this process and to make sure that you're actually successful on your first attempt. Um, you know, as soon as you're ready, you're ready to submit. But this can this can take time. That it really depends where your gaps are. If you have access, easy access to all areas, for instance, to get your your reporting done, to get your you know your feedbacks and so on, then it might not take as long. But if it's difficult and you have to be a little bit more creative about plugging all of those other gaps, then it can take longer. And there's also a question about the law. Um, so, the, uh, so that answers the question also about how recently submitted evidence should be. But regarding the logbook, um, there's questions about logbooks. Some people have got written logbooks. Do you need to convert them into electronic format or do you just scan them and demonstrate it like that? I think uh, you, when you, you were in the college, what happened? <laughs> um, preferably given the you know number of pages that an assessor has to go through, um, most people's handwriting is not particularly easy to, to read. You're making it a lot easier for someone if everything is typed. Um, it doesn't mean that if there's something submitted which is in handwriting is easy yeah. to, to read, that it cannot be yeah. done. But I think if you want to have your assessor to be on a friendly side, it's probably easier to make sure everything is very easy to, to read and not something where you need a you know, translator something to decipher what that handwriting actually represents. And I would say, okay, a little tip here, go to fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Get someone who will read your logbook and just type it out for you. It'll cost you a, a fraction of the amount of time that it'll take you to do. And um, simple, you know, 10 pounds and you'd have got your whole logbook 
given to you in a fantastic format. So do that. And um, I, I think and, if yeah. we can just add to that as well, Dr. G, I think Nicola's about to read my mind. So maybe you want to do this. <laughs> just going to say that we have a, a logbook template that will happily give free of charge. <laughs> um, so, Sorry. Yeah. You go ahead, Tom. No, I was just going to say we, the reason that we've got that is so that when you're applying for jobs, uh, it's very helpful for anyone who's receiving your CV to review your logbook at the same time. Um, so you, you're kind of killing two birds with one stone, if you like, by having it in an electronic format. And uh, yeah, so um, there's also a question um, about uh, clinical correspondence that I'm submitting be verified by my primary referee. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think you need to get everything verified by your primary referee. Um, I don't think you need to go into that kind of detail about do I need two appraisals? Um, do they need to be from the UK? Um, not necessarily. They can, they, you just have to demonstrate that you've had appraisals. But if you can get one in the in the UK, you'll at least know what the process is like. Um, there's a question about the split of 1,200 pages. I, that's not an answer question that we can sort of answer. You know, what's the split of the, uh, if you have 1,200 pages, how many pages is one CIP from one to six? It, it, I, it, it's not a it's as much data as you need. And I know that's not being helpful, but once we become a little bit more experienced, we should be able to give you a, a, a sort of rough idea of whether it's enough, uh, what you've got so far. Um, if you, uh, and we don't have the program ready as such, but when we do, and if you wanna be part of that, then we, we will be able to help you with that. And I know Catherine has, has offered to help with that. So, um, and then uh, can I get the third or fourth year training post using a fellowship for another country and gather evidence towards Caesar while working without, while I work to complete my FRCR. I think sure, you know, there's no reason why you can't use any evidence of training. There's no problem with that, is there Catherine? So that is a question more about the combined route, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think it should pathway. be okay because again, you're, you know, you're, you're collecting, what you're doing, you're collecting evidence. I don't see a problem in, in that respect. Yeah, and the other question was whether the logbook needs to show every case I did in the last five to six years, or shall I gather it in a group of numbers in a systematic base? I, I don't know the, uh, we, uh, when we did CCT, we didn't, obviously didn't have to give every single report. But I no, think you have you to give a sample. Yeah, well, it's, it's helpful to have a, um, like a spreadsheet or something to show what you have done in each year or maybe even break it down for each month. Um, so that shows a little bit of what your actual workload is per month um, and also per year, what your overall numbers are. It doesn't have to be complex, but an assessor really wants to see what have you done? Because if let's say someone has maybe only done 10 CTPs in five years of training, then I, as a, as a, you know, someone looks at it, will say, well, I'm not quite sure this person is really adequately trained to do this independent here in this country, which would be expected if you come and get your CCT. So, or your, you know, your Caesar. Yeah. And there's also a question about the reflection app. Uh, what can we use? I don't know a specific reflection app. I used to use a website called Clarity for, uh, for appraisals, but I am sure we will have something anyway on our website where you can have notes. We've just introduced that into revised radiology and we'll probably be able to easily put that onto the coaching circle. So you can use that and then you just need to use a printout. Um, and then there's, there was a question which we answered before. Um, and then about how many radiology reports to submit us. There's a lot of questions around how many, how many, and it's very difficult, I think, to answer that question with a number. And I think Catherine is also saying, nodding away, saying, you yes, know, it's, it's very difficult to get. It's a very difficult. Again, try to do as much as possible and make sure it's a mix between normal and pathology. So if you just submit normal reports this is not sufficient, even if you have, let's say, 50 of normal reports, you want to show that you have really covered a wide range of pathologies, the hence the need to really collect as much evidence as possible. And uh, there was also a question about whether the radiology reports should be approved or dictated or co-read by me. 
or of any of them. I, I think the report should really be one that you generated. You don't want to just copy someone else's report and you want to you want to show reports that you generated that might have been double reported by someone else or supervised. Yeah, that, that's correct. It's not sufficient to use someone else. And even if you know you haven't been named on the report, your name needs to be on the report. But it also needs to be very clear from the report that you're the one who has generated this report. It's OK for a consultant or maybe a senior registrar to double check and sign it off. But you need to be named on this report. And there's also a question about radiology intervention procedure experiences in the post CTT completion necessary. I suppose the co-training period, do you need intervention after your training? Do you need it in the last 15 years? I suppose is the question. It's, it's again, I think it's the five years. Um, five, the last five years. The last it's five still, years. Still answers yes. five years. So yeah. yeah. Even if you have been working in a, uh, interventional radiology post 10 years ago and all you did was interventional radiology, you're still expected to show the evidence from the last five years. Yeah, and if you have conference certificates, paper published, uh, poster presentations, that was a question, is it needed? Well, it's really good to show that you've been doing something like that, you know, because most registrars in the UK, basically you're trying to get equivalents. All registrars in the UK would have presented something somewhere. I'd suggest uh, that's a really easy way as well to, to gather evidence. Things like attending conferences and writing reflective pieces on that, you're gaining CPD points. And it's a, you know, if you're going anyway, like you said, those Jacob, and it takes five minutes for you to write a reflection about what you've learned, then it's a, that's an easy win as, as far as I can see. Yeah, someone has mentioned also about the Kazen app for evidence and assessments. I don't personally know much about the Kazen app. I've heard of it, but um, if any of you know, then you can mention that. But anything, anything you use that can be printed out or rather exported into a format that you can present in an electronic format, that's, that's all that you need. Anything that can be exported into a PDF or Word document that you can show as evidence would be any app like that. Uh, you don't need signatures. There was a question about does the logbook require signatures? I don't think you need signatures these days. Who does signatures? But you need probably, you know, you probably need something to show that it's been checked. I would say you can cross reference it obviously with your workload statistics. You know, there has to, it has to be it has to match. If you say you've you've done certain things and it doesn't show up in your workload statistics, then that's a little bit of a red flag. Yeah. Okay, so logbooks can, and, and there, there's a question about, can a logbook replace areas where I don't have reports with my name, example, nuclear medicine? So it may be a case where, um, I don't know, is... What you can do, and that's very easy, if you have done, for instance, nuclear medicine co-reporting, but your name is not on it, please ask your consultant or co-reporter to write you um, a piece of paper, um, like, like a reference to see and to, to demonstrate what have you done, maybe even detailed numbers and which areas, what kind of reports, let's say, reported 20 bone scans, 50 VQ scans and so on. That will also count towards the evidence. Yeah. So you are actually using um, someone else is sort of ref, ref, being a referee for you that you've actually done it. Uh, there was a question about the minimum number of audit projects needed for CSER, one or two. I, I don't have a number again, but I would say, you know, two at least, wouldn't you say? It's, it has to be completed again. The audit loop has to be yeah, completed. It has to be a full six from, from my experience of looking at many, many applications, most applicants have got a range of, because again, remember this is for the last five years. So you would expect to have at least one project a year. So you really, if you only submit one, that would be seen as really not quite sufficient here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in the UK, and this we will go into much more detail, but when we look at, when you go through a whole, um, what we call ARCPs, um, which is a sort of yearly appraisal of the registrars, you would want to check they've been doing an audit, they've done some papers, they've done, so think about how you can, you can um, what we're going to show, show you eventually is how can you, um, sort of copy that process. So if you start now, at least you know that in five years you're gonna complete it. It could be much easier. There's been a question about whether you could start with applying for CESA with FRCR2A. There's no point because you need to be anyway. So you can start the process, start the process of collecting the data, but 
there's no point till you've got your FRCR and actually submitting the evidence anyway. Um, and PET CTs, if you do PET CTs, does that cover nuclear? I think that would be pretty good, actually. You know. Yes, it it cover it counts towards it. But again, you need to have some form of evidence that you have been involved in in reviewing of these guns. Yeah, and Umer has asked a question, so I'm going to ask. He wants to speak, I think. So I'll unmute him. Um, yes, and uh, then there's yeah, Umer. Do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to ask the question. I am working as a specialty doctor uh, in radiology in the UK and it's just after doing my MD from my home country. I come across a lot of uh, uh, foreign, graduate, uh, foreign uh, postgraduate radiologists who have done their, who have got their GMC through Flab route and are looking for a job uh, uh, for quite a long time now. Uh, I know some who have been looking for a job for more, more than a year. And uh, a few of them who have eventually, just out of their desperation, have got a job as a sonographer. Although I, I have no doubts that they can work as a radiologist. And I, since I'm working in the system, I know how much uh, shortage do, do we have uh, uh, for radiologists. And since this webinar uh, has been hosted or somehow supported by media resourcing, and they're one of the, one of the largest uh, uh, resourcing for radiologists, I just wanted to know. From the, I have myself been beneficiary of the Southwest FRCR courses, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for, for, for those who are, who are taking up FRCR, and I'm also in the middle of doing my FRCR. Uh, can you please tell me how you can help, and I'm asking it from you, Dr. how yeah. you can help from your platform to, you, you can help those uh, postgraduates some of them are young, some of them are consultants back home to get settled in the UK and they can be a wonderful resource uh, to somehow combat the shortage of radiologists. I don't know uh, how my question is changed, but Yeah, but, I absolutely uh, understand your question, Umar. And I would say that I have, um, I have met many doctors like you describe um, who are sonographers here who are were highly trained back at home and have come and worked to um, sonographers because, um, you know, because they couldn't get it. Now, I would say the number one thing is to get your FRCR. If you're a radiologist, get your FRCR. And, you know, and thank you very much for the uh, glowing uh, testimonial of what we do, because we are absolutely determined to help people and we are now going further and we're trying to get people through in the first attempt and we're trying to say do not part, sit your exam till you've uh, till you're ready and 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 i'm pretty confident that most people like you will be able to pass you've got the knowledge you just need to know how to apply it and how to be confident um so that's certainly one thing that passing the frcr but getting settled and all that that is something again that you know, BDI resourcing, Tom and Nicola, they, they have a team who actually help through the whole process. So that is the beauty of what we are sort of doing together where, um, and, 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 and really there is no financial thing between us at all. We are completely doing it on a sort of benefit for the customer basis. So we, 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 they're trying to just help you to, to get a job in the UK and they're probably the best people to look at where to, how to place you. But I'd say number one, get your FRCR. If you can get your FRCR, then it's really, really easy to place you in a post, which may be uh, either MTI if you're in India or you could uh, getting as a trust grade and then use that as an option or a locum consultant and use that as a, as a way of getting into the system. Now, in terms of personally being able to help people through the CESA process, that is something that Catherine and myself and the team in Coaching Circle are certainly going to be thinking about because we think we can help. Um, it's obviously not something we can do for free, but we don't know yet because this is really the first webinar we are producing on the surface. I mean, both Catherine and I have had an extensive experience in the NHS. Um, um, both from me from when I was a reg SHO onwards up to when I was a consultant, but I've also been the clinical director. I've been, um, you know, uh, so between us, I think we've got enough experience to help people through the whole process. I can't tell you right now exactly what form that's going to take. 
but but watch the space, I think. And together with BDR resources, I think we'll be able to create something that's a winning combination. That that is that is just the the the, the hub of it. I don't know if Tom can advise on is there another route? I don't know. I, I think I think the harsh reality from a workforce point of view is that Dr. Jacob is absolutely right. There are a lot of doctors who even have FRCR who struggle to pass interview. And so for people who have gone through the PLAB route, you have to remember, you know, and again, I would say that probably it's, it's ill advice more than anything else that, because we certainly would advise within any specialty that you have a Royal College or equivalent qualification before coming to the UK, if at all that is possible, um, is that you, 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 there is no benchmark for someone who's in the UK to, to know what your clinical level of practice is. So for someone who has FRCR, a UK trained doctor will have completed that. And so they know exactly what's expected of someone to pass that exam, hard, hard as it is. But there is always a, a trepidation, certainly when I speak to consultants, and I'm, I'm sure Nicola can add to this when I'm, when I'm finished, that if you don't have a Royal College qualification, they, they probably don't know anything about the training that's, that's taken place for you prior to that point in time. And so it's very, very difficult, especially where especially with reporting at a consultant level is is independent that for a lot of places that have backlogs they they don't want to employ people that they would have to double report for that that would be my assessment uh, from from what i've seen nicola i don't know if you want to add to that yeah absolutely i think our greatest challenge at the moment because of what's happening globally um a lot of doctors haven't been able to pass their 2b exams um, I know a lot of them are frustrated. Um, some have even gone to the extent of then, um, you know, taking their PLAB exams, et cetera, just so that, you know, on the provider that they think they can then get a job in the NHS. But what we're experiencing uh, from the feedback from our clients um, that their preference is, is ultimately doctors that have FRCR. And if they don't, they're not, you know, it, and I, and I just want to add one more thing as well. A lot of doctors can get through the FRCR with relatively okay English, okay? But when you start applying for a consultant job, you need to be someone who people can understand. And I would say that if your English is not very fluent, then it would take, it would be extremely helpful or you don't have the right interview techniques. And I work, when we work on revised radiology, I always say that in my webinars, you know, no one's going to tell you this normally, but I can tell you because I'm also from overseas that if you can work on your language and your presentation skills and the way you present yourself, all of which we can improve through through the coaching circle and interview courses and, um, you know, that kind of stuff, then you are likely to stand out against someone who is stuttering, who doesn't really stuttering, I mean, or doesn't really know how to present himself when he's asked a question. For example, you're asked a question, what is your weak side? And you just go silent. You know, that doesn't look good. Or, you know, tell me about the last complaint you, 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 complaint you had against you. And then you come up with a silly answer, like, I don't have any complaints, which is definitely a lie. Because most people, if you're a human, then you probably will have someone who has an issue with you and the reflection behind that. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do to improve your presentation skill. And we work with that. We work with that from the FRCR onwards, but hopefully, and because we believe that there's certainly a, a, a bias that is not clear, that if you can present yourself well, I think you have a better chance of passing exams as well as CESAR. And, um, and the so that we we've had a few more questions and i'll just i will just quickly go through them because i think we are way past time but in terms of minimum requirement for research activity i don't think there's a minimum requirement but you need to have some you need to demonstrate in the last five years does an audit need to be full cycle yes it needs to be an audit it needs to show what you've done you need to do something to improve on it and then re-audit to show an improvement um and so it's not possible. And there's a question about, you know, can you apply for Caesar and then complete 2B? No, you can't. Uh, you need to have 2B really. Do my reports have need positive findings and follow up outcomes? No, I don't think so. You don't need surgery to confirm your findings. Although if you have surgical proof and you can present it, that just shows that that show that fits into another box, which is that you follow up. 
you follow up what happens to your patient. It demonstrates a radiologist who's actually interested in his learning from his experiences to what happened next, you know. All very much, I wanna especially thank Tom and Nicola for the fantastic effort to a, a really ridiculous presentation here. And all we've done is, is made it, um, you know, we've presented it for you. Thank you very much, Nicola, for your effort. And Tom too, it's fantastic. Yeah, certainly brings, uh, brings in the credibility. Thank you very much, all of you.